By the late 90s, the tabloids were having a field day accusing her of marijuana and cocaine use. Editor Nick Mayer from the National Enquirer says there are so many stories of stupors, binges and overdoses, you need a book to cover it all. He is a, a big cocaine abuser. Where are all the police reports? Where are the arrests? If this is happening day in and day out for she years. She has an entourage surrounding her that are paid to protect her. But starting in March 2000, a series of events took the rumor mill to the mainstream press. It began when Whitney was rehearsing to sing at the Oscars. She showed up at the Oscars, and I forget the song that she was supposed to be doing, mm -hmm. but she forgot it too. She did <laughs> not know the words. Whitney Houston is supposed to sing Somewhere Over the Rainbow at the Oscars. Mm. These are photographs of the rehearsal. Uh, she gets up there, and obviously she was somewhere over the rainbow because she couldn't remember the words to the song or even what song to sing. James Robert Parrish, author of Whitney Houston, The Unauthorized Biography. She just seemed to be playing an imaginary piano while she was waiting around and just nobody could really make contact with her. Bobby Brown, her husband, was sitting in the front row, drunk with a coat over his head. By the time the show was on, Whitney was out. She was replaced. But it was another concert in August 2001 that suggested she was nosediving. It was the Michael Jackson tribute concert. She did show up, or at least a fraction of her did. Look how ridiculously skinny she is. She had gotten so emaciated that literally the bones in her chest were sticking out her rib cage. She looked so bad, reportedly, even Michael Jackson told her he was concerned. Michael Jackson? Towards the end of the summer, there was a notice on the internet that flew around, Whitney has died. It's over now. She wasn't dead, but her music career was in rapid decline. Coming up next, confronting the rumors, the singer faces the music. But a new problem emerges, pitting father against daughter. By 2002, Whitney Houston was battling allegations of drug use, speculation about her decreasing weight, even rumors of her own death. No, she wasn't dead, but some of these reports she would later claim forced her to re-examine her life. In late 2002, she admitted publicly to drug use, insisting it was in the past. She said she was so thin due to stress that she was never an addict. Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Isabel Wilkerson interviewed Whitney for Essence magazine. She describes herself as being in transition of working and trying really hard to get focused on uh, what's important to her. But if that meant singing, well then, the bad news had not come to an end. So are you looking at me? In November 2002, her new CD came out called Just Whitney. It was just awful, according to critics. And the buying public agreed, making it her worst-selling album ever. Right. And in 2002, another problem emerged. This man. His name is Kevin Skinner. He used to be partners with Whitney's father, John Houston. He said that in 2000, the star asked them to help her troubled career. She called us. We didn't call her. And what'd she say? Help. Never knew that you would do this to me. Do this to me. Try to ruin, ruin me. Skinner says it all started when he became personally involved in the one public incident linking the singer to drugs. On January 11, 2000, Whitney was at an airport in Hawaii on her way home when a security check uncovered marijuana in her bag. According to police reports, she was asked to wait for the police, but the star boarded her scheduled flight and took off. She thought she was going to get arrested at the airport. Kevin, am I going to jail? Am I going to jail? Trying to dirty up Whitney's name? No, no. In letters to Whitney, her father and his partner contend they worked with authorities in Hawaii and New Jersey to keep the singer from getting a criminal record. She pled no contest to a misdemeanor drug offense, and eventually the charge was dropped. 
But Skinner says the singer now wanted her father's help in salvaging her career. Indeed, according to this letter, John Houston writes his daughter, he worked hard to save your name and reputation, the family's name and legacy, and my granddaughter's future. Shortly after, reports started circulating that Whitney got a new $100 million recording contract. But according to Skinner, salvaging Whitney's career wasn't about getting her on stage as much as getting her off drugs. Do well, I think she's an addict? It's my personal opinion, yes. Skinner says he became repeatedly involved in trying to keep Whitney away from drugs. How does somebody who's a big superstar like Whitney Houston, everybody knows Whitney, how does she get drugs? <laughs> yeah, but, yeah she but everyone will say, that's Whitney Houston, maybe I'll tell my friends. Does she ever go out on her own and get them? And Bobby, together. Would go where? To Newark. Where? To Clifton Avenue. Skinner knows these mean streets well, maybe too well. In 1988, he served time for selling cocaine. I was cocaine distributor years ago, maybe 10, 15 years ago. Um, and that's how I know Whitney. You sold drugs to Whitney Houston? Uh, years ago, yes. We used to engage in a lot of activity with uh, drugs. But he says that he's all more than a decade behind him now, thanks in great part to Whitney's father. He gave me a lot of self-respect, and he made a man out of me. It's obvious to see it, exactly what I need. So he says when Whitney's father wanted to quell the drug rumors about his daughter, Skinner went back to the streets to tell dealers to stop selling her drugs. How did you know how to be the cleanup guy in that drug world? Because I was once a drug dealer and I knew all the people. You know that world because you've lived in that world. I lived that world. You can navigate through that world. Totally. In this letter to the singer, Skinner writes that he silenced a drug dealer who talked about her in the tabloids. You didn't need this problem. I took care of it. Yes. So why is this man suddenly airing all this dirty laundry in public? Well, this may explain it. A lawsuit. In September 2002, her father's company filed a $100 million suit claiming Whitney didn't pay him and his business partner for their services. Yes, that is father suing daughter. Sometimes it's wrong and sometimes it's right. So what does the diva have to say about all this? In legal filings, she dismissed Kevin as a hanger-on, arguing she had no business with him. And as for her father, her lawyers argue that the advice she took from him was as daddy. Sometimes you lie, sometimes you cry. And perhaps father and daughter would have been able to resolve this matter, but in February 2003, John Houston passed away. Whitney paid her final respects privately at his open casket, but did not attend his funeral. My sense is that the last two years have probably been among the most difficult for her and maybe her entire life. Two years of confronting publicly her drug use, handling her first failed CD, dealing with a painful lawsuit, and facing her own father's death. And suddenly, at least for many people, out of the blue, she suddenly showed up in Israel. I'm here on a spiritual retreat. I'm going to look for the black Hebrews that I feel part of. Visiting my family in Demona, yes. my friends and family, the city of peace. She has never been in conventional rehab. According to reports, she has decided to turn her life around through spirituality. She was a church-going girl, and she describes herself as having gotten away from that and that she's paid a price for having done so. Hello. This past May, she popped up in the Holy Land, where she took a bus and rode three hours into the heart of the desert to immerse herself in the teachings of a small group of African Americans who believe they are members of the lost tribes of Israel. So was this redemption or just the latest strangest thing she'd done yet? Coming up next, the video everyone's talking about, Whitney's summer vacation in Israel. See it for yourself. The high moments, the low moments, and some very odd moments.